family that just they just know we're not the only intelligent race on the planet or they have a feeling Atlantis was a real place. But you actually dig up documents, research cases, and you don't sacrifice your credibility just to sex it up, you know? Well, well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I've always, I mean, my background is in, in journalism, in sort of regular journalism, and I've always sort of been of the case that just because I'm writing about Bigfoot or UFOs or Roswell or whatever, you know, it doesn't mean your brain has to go out the window. You know, you should still apply the same journalistic techniques. And when you can uncover facts, when you can uncover facts, tell people it's facts. When you've got something that's an intriguing bit of data, which is suggestive of something, well, tell them it's just suggestive, you know, but don't go in there with this belief system that this is what it is, you know, and it's cast in stone if you were not able to prove that it is cast in stone, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great because there's a lot of times I think people get maybe too close to the work and they're like, maybe a yeah. placebo effect takes hold and they're like, well, yeah. I did see a spirit. And it's like, well, how funny is it that Rarely do people see them, but the guy who researches them is now seeing them. So, I mean, you know, it is what it is. So. Yeah. Well, let's do the normal thing and dig into your newest book, The Pyramids and the Pentagon. Right. Uh, would you mind kind of summarizing it up for the people? Yeah, sure. Well, basically, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody's heard of the whole ancient astronaut scenario, um, Eric Von Daniken, and Zachariah Sitchin, and shows on TV now like Ancient Aliens, you mm -hmm. know, the idea that in the distant past we were visited by extraterrestrials and that they were responsible for a lot of our mythologies, folklore, beliefs, etc., you know, of higher entities coming down from the sky in fiery chariots, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, dozens and dozens of books have been written on the subject and, you know, you could make a good case of saying, well, what else could, <laughs> could be written about it all? But there was one of the things that I got little snippets of information of from time to time which I never really did much with until I realized that, well, if you do do something with it, there's a big story here. And that was what government agencies know about the whole ancient astronauts angle. You know, there have been a lot of theorizing and books telling the story in general of what people believe happened, you know, thousands of mm -hmm. years ago, but not from what the perspective of what the Pentagon knew or believed or concluded about it all. So what I did was to start digging into this more and more and uncovering more data and ultimately just basically demonstrated that since at least the late 40s, U.S., British, and other uh, countries in some uh, cases have sort of dug very deeply into, you know, ancient history with a view to addressing this whole angle of, you know, where we visited by somebody else at some point. It's that angle, the fact that it's the uh, research that the governments have done that lets you explore so many different areas within the book because they got their hands in everything, really. Like, they don't really shrug anything off the way they make it seem to the public that they do. Well, I think, you know, governments are good at that. I mean, they have, first, they've got a huge budget. So, True. you know, giving $3 million to this think tank and $5 million to that one or whatever, you know, pretty much ensures that all bases are going to be covered. And... You know, one of the, you're quite right. They didn't sort of really avoid anything. You know, that if it was a mystery of the past, and they felt there was some gain to be obtained from looking into it. You know, whether it was the Dead Sea Scrolls, Noah's Ark, the pyramids, the face on Mars, um, Atlantis, uh, the Ark of the Covenants. You know, that they covered all bases of yeah. you know sort of ancient relics and mysteries. It all seems a little less silly when you see all the documentation that they looked into it, but. Um... The the book is full of phenomenal stories, but one of my favorites, I'd say, and it was also pretty new to me, was the uh, Harry Cooper Roswell account. Uh, would you mind telling us oh, about yeah. the details there? And do you do you believe his story? Yeah, sure. I can I can answer all those questions for you. Cool. <laughs> um, basically, the the story that we can verify is that in 1947, which was the year of Roswell, the year the flying saucer was born the year the CIA was created. It was also the year in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were found at... Um, crazy year. On the Dead Sea. Yeah, crazy year, weird year. And also the year that Aleister Crowley died. So there's a lot of strange stuff going on in 47. Oh. Um, and when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, as I said, this coincided with the CIA being set up. And the CIA actually set up an office in Damascus, in the Middle East, um, in the American Embassy in, in the city of Damascus. And on one particular day, um, this guy came into the offices, sort of like Middle Eastern character, 
in these long flowing Bedouin type robes and acting very mysteriously and said mm -hmm. that he'd got something he wanted to show to someone in a position of authority. So the embassy called um, this one particular guy down, Miles Copeland, who was a senior operative in the CIA at the time. And he was also, as a strange little aside, he was the father of um, Stuart Copeland, the drummer out of the police. But that's got nothing to do with the story, <laughs> but, uh, but he was anyway. Um, and so they called Copeland down, and basically um, this guy pulled out this roll that looked like an ancient parchment, um, very much like the Dead Sea Scrolls that we know today. And this guy, this mysterious character, wanted somebody to look at it and try and decipher um, or, you know, code break it, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so, being in the CIA, um, Copeland said, well, you know, I've got somebody or people I can, you know, pass this on to and they can have a look at it. And so he was, this guy was happy with this and he left and promised to come back later, but he never did. He just sort of, it was almost like he actually, it was a ruse just to get it off his hands and give it to the CIA which is kind of odd because, you know, this particular scroll um, was sent to the CIA, Copeland photographed it, and it just literally vanished into the, you know, the archives or the, the depths of the CIA, mm -hmm. never resurfaced. Now, you know, the other Dead Sea Scrolls are all on public display, so it's almost like there's something unique about this one that when the CIA deciphered it, they didn't want to give it up for some weird reason, which sort of, you know, opens possibilities as whether or, you know, did it contain something really weird and significant in right. it. But regardless of that, the story gets even stranger. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, a number of UFO researchers, uh, one being William Steinman in the 80s, who was looking into a crashed UFO case in northern New Mexico in the 40s, and Timothy Cooper, who was looking into the Roswell case, um, but, you know, 50 years later in the 1990s when he got into it, um, Tim Cooper's dad served in the U.S. military and had told Timothy Cooper about how he was he supposedly printed off this lengthy report for the military on a crashed UFO incident in New Mexico in the summer of 47. It wasn't Roswell, but it was reportedly another one in the state of New oh, Mexico. Oh, okay. And according to um, Cooper's father, who I actually was able to get his military files and verify that he was at the base he claimed to be when he said he printed this document. Um, he said that when the military got into the remains of this sort of wrecked UFO, they found an ancient parchment that sort of retrospectively, at the time they didn't realize, but retrospectively sounded like or looked like, you know, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was written in some sort of look like, you know, a very ancient language. Um, yeah, that's so weird. And it was, yeah, it was reportedly taken to code breakers from the National Security Agency when that was set up in 52, and everybody had a hard time trying to decipher it. And um, and that, that's a weird story, you know. The, the idea of a crashed UFO coming down is sensational enough. But right. then being found with like a Dead Sea Scroll inside it is even more sensational. Now, you know, when you ask me, do I believe the story, there's absolutely no doubt that the the first part of the story has been verified and backed up by other CIA, uh, CIA people. The idea mm -hmm. that that Miles Copeland was a recipient of this particular scroll, and that the CIA did acquire it, and that it vanished within the CIA and has never resurfaced since. So we do know that an intelligence agency in the U.S., known as the CIA, has had a deep interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now. The next part of the story, you know, about the military having an interest in another type of scroll but found in a saucer, I take it one of two ways. I, well, actually, there's three ways. You can either interpret the story literally, you know, that a UFO came down and the scroll was found. You can take it the idea that, you know, a UFO did come down, but the scroll story was added by... I guess, people in government to try and discredit the researchers, mm -hmm. you know, rather than to actually cre add credibility to the story, just make it over the top to where people would walk away from right, it, you know, and right. agencies are good at doing that. Yeah. Or the third possibility, of course, is that it's complete nonsense. Now, my view and my experience is that when you start to get to the close of some, you get close to some sort of mystery where there's a government angle, you often do find people coming forward who try and push onto you sensational stories. 
And I think sometimes that is done to try and discredit the more credible angle. But in this case, I'm not entirely sure that's all there is to it. I would say that was all there is to it if it wasn't for the fact that we can prove that the CIA really did have an interest in the Dead Sea Skulls. Yeah. You see what I mean? That, that's the weird thing. It's not like the entire story can be disproved. Right. The one part of it can be proved. And, of course, this begs the bigger question, well, why on earth would the CIA be analyzing and even hiding afterwards the mm -hmm. Dead Sea Skulls? Even if right. they analyzed it, why didn't they, just, yeah, why didn't they just hand it over to the bigger collection, which is now on public display for anybody and everybody to see. Yeah. You know, that sort of makes you wonder if there really was something to this story. So. Yeah, that's a crazy thing to be inside a UFO. I thought that was the Roswell one, but as far as Roswell goes, I've always loved that story. It was one of the, that and the Loch Ness Monster is kind of what got me when I was really young. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many Roswell theories. Like, there's, you know, that they were uh, genetic mutations and they mm -hmm. were... You know, all kinds of different, every country's probably been held responsible from one angle for the Roswell crash, like as some <laughs> of their secret technology. But if you had to put your money on the story as you see it being most accurate, how does the Roswell story go? Did they find bodies? Well, Did they not? Yeah, I think they found something and they found bodies. And I think, you know, there's no way it was a weather balloon. And the, right, the yeah, idea that's, that it that's was a, like ridiculous. A, yeah, and the idea also that it was this mogul balloon that, you know, the that there's nobody disputes the government was flying these big mo mogul balloons at the time. But the idea it was that and crash test dummies, that doesn't hold water. So I think it can only go in one or two directions. One is a literal UFO with alien bodies or some sort of dark and dubious military experiments with human guinea pigs on board that went wrong and that was so controversial. You know, one of the theories is, you know, could they have used, like, Japanese prisoners of war? Yeah. I mean, this is one that I addressed in, in one of my books. Um, either it was a genuine UFO or it was, um, like, a dark and dubious experiment that would create such a scandal that it had to be hidden. So, but then again, when you listen to the descriptions of the bodies, you know, they don't sound like regular people, you know, if you're out, but then again, if you read them, they're not like the classic greys, you know, these little spindly grey guys with the big black eyes. Mm -hmm. Most of the books talk about them being more human-like and about five feet tall. So my view is that it was either a UFO or some bizarre military experiment. human experimentation. And I don't think there's any ground for anything else other right than on. that. You know, weather balloons, mogul balloons, crash test dummies, you know. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, uh, but the big problem is, you know, it's I've sort of made this analogy before. It's kind of like Jack the Ripper or Who Killed Kennedy. You know, that these mysteries are so, getting so old now. Everybody's dying off. The government's mm -hmm. saying nothing. And it's like, how do we take it to the next step? You know what I mean? It's Can we even resolve it? Right. Um when everybody's dead and the government said, well, we've looked for the files, sorry, there's nothing, go away. You know, short of, well, I, mean, I say short of, I, don't, I just don't know how, you know, 10 years from now, if, if Roswell isn't solved to the point where we can prove what happened. We might never know. I just or... don't know. No, we may never know because I just don't know how we can go to that next step. So. Yeah. Well, hey, let me ask you something uh, a little more modern, that being – the U.S. involvement in the Middle East. It seems a little national treasure, but this is my favorite part of the book. Do you see any reasons to think that we may be there for something a little more serious than oil? I mean, and of course not to fight terrorism. Well, yeah, I mean, this is one of the interesting things, the idea that, you know, at least part of the, the reason for the presence in like Iraq, for example, um, you know, there have been these stories about, um, you know, sort of ancient priceless artifacts and sort of, I guess, like science and technology developed thousands of years ago by the ancients that might still be sort of hidden somewhere in Iraq. I mean, there's, there's several of these stories. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I talk in the book about the story of Jim Mars, who had been researching this so-called white gold, as it's known, which, you know, the speculation is it's the so-called manna from heaven that, you know, could extend lifespans and rejuvenate cells. And, right. um, you know, I mean, today's scientists are, are trying to crack the code, you know, to prevent aging. I don't mean, you know, some old lady having a face pulled back with Botox or whatever. Of you know, I mean, literally slowing down 
the, the process of how the body, you know, just decays over time. You know, it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing, but it does, you know. Right. But, there's, but, you know, if you could stop it. And this is one of the fears with this sort of white gold, the idea that maybe, because it ties in with Iraq, you know, could it be that the ancients were either given or developed some technology that would allow that to happen? Now, there's also the fact that, you know, when the invasion of Baghdad occurred, um, one of the places that was heavily looted was the Baghdad Museum. Mm -hmm. And there have been rumors for a long time of, again, technological artifacts going back thousands of years secretly held in the Baghdad Museum. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that when there was literally thousands of items looted from the museum, and a substantial amount were never recovered, what was interesting is that many of the ones that were never found or recovered again, I should say, were actually taken from the basement of the museum. And when a, a study was done, it was almost, or it looked like to many people on the investigation, that that area had been deliberately targeted and doors had been unlocked to allow people to get in there and specifically target certain areas and, you know, take certain items. And again, this has led to the theory that, you know, maybe that was one of the reasons that, you know, it was under cover of a, you know, a war-torn area that these items were sort of shipped out and because of all the battles going on and bombs going off, nobody noticed, you know, what was going mm -hmm. on literally, you know, beneath their eyes, so to speak. Yeah, and when you look at the, the other angle of the Stargate and the, 20, the 2012 angle, the timing of it is interesting because the Zachariah Stitchin story kind of comes in line with this, but the idea that the Anunnaki will return in 2012 and that the technology that they use to, to arrive here is, is actually in the Middle East and the U.S. is there sort of to take control of that. Where does that story start? Well, yeah, this is... I mean, fragments of this have been sort of circulating for a while, but, I mean, one of the people who discussed this in the last few years was a guy named Michael Saller, a UFO researcher, and he sort of dug deep into this idea, that, you know, of some sort of Stargate, like in the Stargate movie and TV mm -hmm. series, where, you know, instead of, you know, traveling like a vast distance from our sun to another sun, you know, by literally going from point A to point B and, you know, turning on your thrusters and going that you could sort of, I guess, you know, condense the journey by warping space and time. So in other words, you know, you don't travel in like a linear fashion. You actually distort it and arrive from point A to point B in no time at all. Um, and that's the idea of, you know, the, the Stargate scenario. And there have been these rumors about, you know, as you said, some sort of ancient Anunnaki Stargate, possibly in Iraq or somewhere in the Middle East. And, you know, that there have been a flurry of attempts by military and governmental agencies to locate it um, and understand the technology because, again, you know, as you said, the theory is that the Anunnaki are coming back and could this be tied in with December 2012, you know, that they're going to make a reappearance. And, you know, you can look at it from several angles. Again, you know, either the story is true, could it be disinformation, or it could be, as I suspect, that, you know, there are people in government who, who are just like us. They know these stories and they know the rumors and the legends and everything else. And so right. they do what most of us can't do. They have the, the manpower and the funding to actually go out there and see if there's anything to it or not. And I think that could be what's happened here, that they know all these stories. And, and if there's an intelligence capital to be gained, they take the view, well, we can't afford not to look into it. You know, so they go out there. Not necessarily, you know, who knows, you know, where the truth begins and the an end, so to speak, mm -hmm. but by going out there, you know, they ensure that they're going to do their best to find out if there is anything to it. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember is that governments don't always investigate stuff because they 100% believe it. They do it because they don't want to risk leaving any stone unturned, which is actually two very different scenarios. Right. Good point. I mean, and that it seems a little far-fetched, but at the same time, those kind of missions... Uh, they sort of mirror the supposed actions of the Nazis in terms of invading places to seek out ancient relics and stuff, right? No, you, you're quite right. I mean, you know, it, it sounds bizarre until, you know, as you pointed out earlier, that one of the things I did in the book was to use the Freedom of Information Act quite extensively. And, you know, and you find that the CIA's 
house files on Noah's Ark, you know, that we've got government files now showing that agencies were interested in people who were talking about the pyramids built by levitation. So, you know, it, when you look back historically, it's not so strange that somebody would be paying attention to sort of ancient technologies in the Middle East today when 50 years ago they were looking at whether or not, you know, the pyramids of Egypt were built by levitation. There's, there's actually not that yeah. much difference, really. You know, it, it's pretty much the same project, but ongoing, you know. That's a big theme in the book is the, that idea of the ancient levitation or the acoustic yeah. technology. It's funny because another project I have is a conspiracy-themed clothing line called Conspiracies, and one of the first shirt designs I made was just that. It's uh, three UFOs hovering over the pyramids with the blocks sort of floating into place, and it oh, kind of cool. goes right in line with that idea. Oh, that sounds cool. But on, in, uh, in terms of the Nazis, something I've always wondered about the actual culture during World War II is if the ancient alien lineage motive was really out in the open or and it's been edited out by calculated historians or were those ideas kept close to the chest among the leaders even then? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, one of the things we do know, for example, about the, the Nazis, you know, it wasn't just that they believed that they, they, you know, sought out these ancient relics like the Ark of the Covenant, which supposedly had all these, you know, bizarre powers, etc., that it would help them win the war. They actually felt, the Nazis felt that their lineage went back to like an ancient human race. You know, that they, it wasn't just that they were the master race today in their eyes. It was more the fact that they were descended from this sort of race of supermen going back however long. So in other words, they were taking the view that they were already an ancient race and it was time for them to return by, you know, reopening all these ancient aspects of, you know, their original culture, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was, there was this idea that it wasn't just a master race or a super race today in their minds. It was that they were just continuing on to where, you know, it, they left off and sort of, um, I guess, devolved for a while, and now it was time for them to come back again. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. They just thought Hitler was on, you know, the lookout for anything that would help him win the war. But, you know, he actually did have this background to it where he felt he was fulfilling and bringing back, you know, the ancients, which they were descended from. So. Well, and obviously you know about Project Paperclip. For those who don't, it's, you know, the program yeah. to bring Nat Nazi scientists to work yeah. in the state's black ops projects to and uh, avoid persecution and prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, but have you heard any of the stories of Hitler escaping or the Nazis retreating to a camp in the Arctic? Yeah, I mean, there was, with the book, obviously, you know, I was sort of limited in the, the number of pages. I said, right, which is why with the Nazis, I just focused on their involvement in the ancient stuff because it was right. relevant. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole Nazi uh, conspiracy thing, you know, goes much further. You know, you've got the paperclip scientists coming over and the theory that at least some UFOs may have been developed in the late 40s, in the U.S. as an outgrowth of advanced Nazi technology developed in the final stages of the war. Um, and we know, you know, a lot of rocket scientists were brought over. I mean, Werner von Braun, who was one of, you know, the, the main brilliant German rocket scientists um, who built the V-1 and 2, V-2 rockets that bombed London and Britain, um, you know, he became director of NASA. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that's not a joke or a rumor. I mean, Werner von Braun, who was a mm -hmm. Nazi scientist, in the Second World War, became the director of NASA. You yeah, know, hidden in plain sight right there. Yeah, and so, you know, that in itself is kind of bizarre. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got the idea of sort of a, a faction of the Nazis hiding out in um, one of the poles, if you like, the South or North Pole. Interestingly enough, the FBI have declassified a whole file which runs into, uh, I forget the number of pages, but it's a huge file, on people who claimed to have seen Hitler in the sec after the Second World War. You know, they opened a file on all these letters that were coming in from people saying, well, you know, he escaped here and he escaped there. And they did a lengthy and extensive investigation. And I'm not sure if it's online at their website or not, hmm. which is called The Vault, but you can get it from the FBI. And, it, you know, they had like a whole department that was looking into these stories about Hitler, like faking his own death and, you know, fleeing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now this is kind of this is a total 180 from what we've been talking about. I kind of want to talk about some uh, paranormal aspects, uh, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this. 
because I know you've researched a lot of other paranormal stuff, including mm-hmm. stories of like uh, entities that sort of feed on negative energy or yeah. like the torture of the human soul. Uh, yeah. And that that said, it seems to me that there are essentially three levels in government. Like, and I'm simplifying just to kind of get to the point. But the main 90% who just disregard anything paranormal or alien. Then there's like a higher order who it's kind of involved in the occult research, but really doesn't know what's going on. These are the people that are the subject of a lot of the stories in your books. Uh, but then I think there's an even higher group or secret society, mm-hmm. if you will, that's deeply involved in demonic and dark rituals. And I hear these mm-hmm. stories of child trafficking amongst the elites and systematic ritual sexual abuse and these these weird cults. And it just seems to me that the groups know something about how to harness deep emotional trauma. Do you see any parallels mm-hmm. there, or am I kind of stretching? Um, I've never sort of really, you know, delved into that whole abuse angle at all. Um, but what I will say, I mean, I wrote a book in 2010 called Final Events, which was right. a study of how a think tank type group in the government came to believe, you know, that the whole UFO phenomenon was like a demonic deception. I mean, you know, that was their belief system. You know, that's an important thing to stress. You know, it wasn't that they proved that's what it was. That's what they came to believe it was. You know, they felt that like alien abductions were staged by this phenomenon to kind of create like an E.T. meme, if you like, Mm -hmm. Um, when in reality, you know, they were sort of deceiving us into accepting demons amongst us. But, you know, you can find a lot of examples of where the government has dabbled in the occult. I mean, for example, uh, one of the most famous occultists who did extensive work in the late 40s um, for the U.S. military and government was Jack Parsons. You know, Mm -hmm. Jack Parsons set up the Aerojet Corporation, which ultimately made the um, solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle. And, you know, this was a guy who, in his early rocket tests out at Pasadena, um, appropriately enough, at a place called Devil's Gate Dam in um, Pasadena, you know, he, before each rocket launch, he would invoke the god Pan to ensure a successful flight. You know, and he was being funded mm-hmm. by the military at this time. And he was also a disciple of Aleister Crowley, who was also, um, who had extensive links with both British and American intelligence. Um, Crowley was, you know, and, and Parsons after Crowley's death, um, you know, they're both engaged in trying to open portals and doorways to other realms of existence and, you know, letting these higher entities and Crowley supposedly did this um, in 1917 with this entity known as LAM, L-A-M. Right. If you Google Alistair Crowley plus LAM and you look at the picture of LAM, it looks just like the alien on the front cover of Whitley Strieber's Communion. Um, apart from the eyes, but everything else looks the same, you know, it's just got this hypnotic... Weird big head and little shoulders, etc. So, you know, but as I said, the important thing is when, in relation to your question, um, I mean, Parsons, you know, he, he was heavily paid and um, funded by the military, but, you know, he was having um, sort of occult masses and everything in, you know, downtown Los Angeles in his house, etc. And, um, but the military didn't care. You know, they recognized he was a brilliant scientist and um, let him do his thing. But there are other examples as well. Um, the CIA, we know again through the Freedom of Information Act in 52, actually opened a small project to determine the feasibility of using Ouija boards to try and contact... And this sounds bizarre, but the, the plan was to try and contact dead CIA agents and have them use their soul to spy on the Russians. You know, you could they passed the message to the Ouija board to go to the Kremlin. You know, it sounds bizarre, yeah. but that that's literally what they were researching. And, you know, they did a lot of research also into, um, you know, everybody knows about the things like, you know, the MK Ultra LSD mind control program. Right. But they were also, you know, the CIA initiated and sponsored trips to South America, you know, to, for, to find psychedelics, psychedelic plants, etc. And, you know, tap into that and try and find out why people had mystical experiences, you know, when the, when they were under the influence of this or that. So, you know, they were looking into some very weird and esoteric areas. Yeah, you actually have uh, a little part of about magic mushrooms in this yeah. most recent book. Uh, tell us about that story, because those, those uh, hallucinations seem pretty wild. 
Yeah. Well, do you want me to tell you about magic mushrooms or the magic mushrooms in the book? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this this is sort of a central part of the story. You know, if it was just a case of government agencies, you know, looking back into the history books and you know, Googling this or whatever, you could say they didn't really have much insight. You know, they were just sort of surfing around the edges. But when you find, you know, they were dealing and looking at stories of reincarnation and people, you know, sort of getting into altered states of mind to where there was a possibility that they were sort of literally sending their soul or essence back through time. You know, they were sort of surfing time while their mind was in this altered state. You know, and the view was that, you know, when you get into this kind of altered state and people have, as some people say, hallucinations, they were actually looking at the idea that rather than being hallucinations, people were seeing literal portals and doorways to other realms that you don't see in a normal, quote, normal state of mind. Yeah. Um, you know, and they were they were listening to people who were, you know, under the influence of this or that, and particularly mushrooms, um, and who were telling stories about seeing vast stones lifted into the air in the, you know, in Egypt by flying saucer type devices, and um, you know, it, they were digging into some very alternative areas. But what was more interesting is that clearly there were some people in government, and this gets back to what you said about like a higher group. There was people in government who clearly realised this was an important area of significance to look into. You know, that they knew that. There was some re they knew, you know, for some reason, there was a good reason for, for digging into this whole angle of, you know, psychedelics and portals being opened and possibly, you know, some military gain coming from all that. It is weird. I think that the psychedelics and paranormal phenomenon and UFOs, I don't know how or why, but to me, those dots kind of connect. It's kind of hazy how, but they all seem like parts of a, the same phenomenon. Well, I mean, there are cases, for example, where people have, you know, been under the influence of LSD, for example. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I quote one story in, I think it was in Final Events, where people have been under the influence of LSD, and they'd both seen a UFO. They'd seen the same UFO. Now, you know, one of the important things about LSD is that What's more uh, equally as important as the, the strength of the dose mm -hmm. is the scene and the setting and the mindset of the person. Of course. And and this is you know tests have proved this that if you're in a bad setting and a negative vibe, the experience is probably not going to be a a good trip. Oh know? yeah. <laughs> no, Don't no, I know? No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> and so in that sense, you know, it's kind of like it's not just the expectation that maybe if you think you're going to see something, you see it. But possibly, if your mind's amenable, when you're in this altered state, you really do open the fabric of reality to something else. You know, it's like DMT, you know, which occurs naturally in the brain. Mm -hmm. Well, when people, you know, are being given like, I won't say overdoses, but extra doses of DMT, they started reported seeing, you know, images of these sort of little elf-like creatures uh -huh. coming through the veil, if you like. And some of these stories are so close to each other, it's difficult to dismiss the idea that, you know, we're seeing something that we don't normally see in in regular situations, you know, what we call reality. But more importantly, these things seem to know when we see them, they know we, that we're seeing them, you know. Right. It's like we've, we've been rumbled, if you like. So. It is very weird. And you mentioned earlier the the face on Mars, and that's one area that I just find it really hard to form an opinion on because yeah. as far as the face on Mars and the Sidonia pyramids, because anything I find compelling, NASA seems to have some high-res photo of some other angle yeah. where it looks like nothing. And the problem is, yeah. you know, if there were structures on Mars or the moon while we're at it, I have no doubt it would be covered up, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's something to cover up. But, you know, what have you seen with that? Yeah, no, you're right. I think the the big problem with the face on Mars is not so much that it's there. It's the fact that the average person isn't able to go and look at it. You know, we can't go there. You know, um, that's the problem. It's kind of like something on the Earth, like the pyramids. You know, anybody can go there and analyze them, etc., and come right. to some form of conclusion. The problem is with the face on Mars, we're strictly and solely limited to, you know, a few photographs, some of which do appear to show a face, 
others that kind of look just like a pommel rubble mesa or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the interesting thing is that, that, I mean, the fact that when you look at it from some angles in certain light, it does look like a face. Now, the, the thing that a number of researchers who believe that it is a face have said is that, you know, the Egyptian pyramids may go back you know, 10,000 years or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. some people do push, you know, some people say, well, it's the official story is like three to 5,000, but maybe we right. can push it back 10 to 15. Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine, Mac Tonis, who wrote a book called After the Martian Apocalypse, uh, Mac theorized, you know, these Martian artifacts could be half a million years old, you know, and if that is the case, you imagine what the Sphinx and today's pyramids in Egypt would look like a half a million years from now that probably wouldn't be that recognizable, you know, beyond the average shape and, huh, that looks kind of face-like, you know, rather than today, it clearly is a face. Um, And so, you know, what I find interesting is that from certain angles, the face on Mars does look Sphinx-like. And also, not far away, you do have structures that look pyramid-like as well. Mm -hmm. So even if it's just a bizarre coincidence the very fact that you do have this things like face and pyramid type structures all in the same area for me suggests we have to look into it you know and um one of the things i point out in the book one of the very weird stories is that there are a number of people in the world of science fiction from the 50s particularly who had links and contacts within the intelligence community the military the cia who actually wrote sci-fi stories and comic books with a with a theme having the theme of them was like faces and pyramids on Mars, you know, and this has led to speculation that maybe somebody in the government knew about the face on Mars decades and decades ago, long before NASA found out, mm-hmm. and may have actually even tried to subtly seed a few of these stories into the public domain to see what the reaction would be, you know, but but do it through the medium of like entertainment with novels and comic books and whatever, and just see. Um, you know, what what the response was. And I mean, for example, Jack Kirby, the famous comic book artist, actually wrote a story called The Face on Mars in 58, which is all about American astronauts going to Mars and finding this huge carved face that stares up from the surface of the planet. You know, you couldn't get, yeah, you couldn't get much closer. If if you Google, again, Jack Kirby plus Face on Mars, you actually, people have scanned in, you know, like the front cover or the, you know, the main page of of the story. And you'll see you know, this huge face on Mars in a story titled The Face on Mars. And Kirby had sort of quasi-official, not quasi-official, but, I mean, he had tangential links with people right. in the CIA. Um, you know, so it's, you get some very weird stuff like that, as if somebody knew um, that, you know, there was weird stuff on Mars that sort of paralleled, you know, the things in Egypt, so to speak. Well, you can find that with... Uh... All kinds of stuff. I mean, I've seen montages about 9-11 that where they've yeah. got all this imagery that came out before 2001, and uh, it's all eerie, very eerie. There's a, One of them is you know, The Simpsons. One of them is the Rugrats movie. One of them is some album cover, uh, yeah. an episode of The X-Files. And it's weird because it's like it almost seems like somebody somewhere knows that there's a link between subliminal messages and... Yeah. Uh, reality. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, this sort of, in one sense, you could argue it ties in with this whole issue about the CIA was sort of looking at the idea of, you know, sort of um, psychedelic trips into the past and possibly the future. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, time isn't as we see it. And possibly, right. you know, maybe some of these, you know, sort of imagery from events that haven't happened yet is is occurring because somebody is literally picking up on something that inevitably is going to happen, you know, and they become kind of like a comic book artist, you know, where do they get their inspiration from? Maybe they really are getting it from the future, you know. Maybe yeah. Jack Kirby's mindset tapped into the fact that 20 years later NASA was going to take these photographs with this weird-looking face, you know. Right. I mean, well, I've heard the theories of... Um there being time portals that we just don't know much about, that the, maybe the Bermuda Triangle is one, maybe yeah. the Loch Ness Monster is a, is something where the, a portal opens up and the energy of a dinosaur or an actual dinosaur comes through. Uh, yeah. You know, and maybe that's what UFOs are, is like future mm-hmm. craft c- coming through for a second. Weird. 
Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of my other big interests is cryptozoology, you know, the study of unknown animals. It's like with Bigfoot. You know, some researchers will tell you Bigfoot's just a, an unidentified ape that science hasn't found. But the more you dig into it, it's clearly not. <laughs> you know, it goes way right. beyond that. Um, you know, you have reports of Bigfoot appearing and vanishing in the blink of an eye, cameras jamming, you know, all sorts of just strange stuff associated with it. Um, and these things come and go. We never catch them. And it is almost like they sort of flit in and out of our reality or possibly our time frame, you know. that It's almost like they're on the equivalent of like the New York subway or the London Underground, you know, yeah. where they jump off at station at station in a way that we don't understand, you know, but it's more like a dimension by dimension possible. I mean, people are afraid of the idea that uh, a secret shadow government knows about our origins and aliens and keeps mm. us in the dark to control us, but a part of me takes comfort in thinking, well, at least somebody can explain all this shit, even if they won't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think you're right when there's like different levels. You know, there's certainly some agencies in government who know nothing. I mean, you take the UFO subject where Project Blue Book was pretty much just like a public relations exercise. You know, they didn't really find much or know much at all. And certainly in the last 10 years or so, it really was just a couple of guys in an office. You know, there was no field work or anything. Yeah. But then you have you know, agencies uh, higher up than them, you know, like the CIA and the NSA doing research. But then you have these other rumors of, you know, what's going on at Area 51, etc., that kind of thing. So I think that's not just the way secrets are kept, you know, by just ensuring not everybody knows because the less people know, but um, the less, you know, the chance of the secret leaking out. But I think it's also connected with, like, powerful ancient people, ancient money, things like that, you know, ancient families, you know, right. these big big business and big money families who are tied in with government and intelligence agencies, etc. Right. And then their corporations. I, I don't, yeah, I don't personally think the ones who are really in the know are just like Pentagon generals. I think it's more like a cabal of, of big money, old families, you know, powerful... Right. Uh, you know, backgrounds and aristocracy, that sort of thing. So. Right. Oh, simply put, if you had to speculate and try to come up with one cohesive worldview out of all your research that you've done, explaining flying saucers and the Mothman and Jinn and yeah. everything, um, what would it look like? Are, are these independent phenomena uh, in your mind, or is there a unifying theory? No. I think there's a unifying theory. I'm not convinced the UF at all that the UFO phenomenon is extraterrestrial in the sense that it's literally aliens coming from planet A to planet Earth. What I think is that the phenomenon is real, but you know you can find clear parallels throughout history where things that have been interpreted as demons, goblins, jinn, and today's aliens it all manifests in the same way. It's all to do with like manifestation in people's bedrooms, like an interest in um, human reproduction and babies and uh, yeah. these sort of predatory entities that kidnap us, time distortions. And I think the kind of the, what I call the alien meme is sort of the modern day equivalent of the demon meme or the goblin meme or whatever meme. You know, something's been interacting with us and manipulating us for as long as we've been around. And I think the current incarnation is the one that's used because we accept the idea that aliens could be out there in the same way that 2,000, 3,000 years ago, there was a, a far bigger belief in like demons and demonic entities, right. uh, far bigger than today. And I think the phenomenon, whatever it is, seems to have some sort of controlling or manipulation factor involving us. Maybe, you know, it ma manipulates our belief systems to keep us in we're like the herd, you know, and they're the yeah. farmer or something. Um, and I think there are people in government who know this. I think there are some people who, like disinf disinformation people who spread stories, you know, suggesting there's nothing to this. Right. Others spread stories suggesting like, how do you alien. Know? Yeah. You don't know. And I think, no. that's, I think the whole point is to, there are people in government who do know right. that part of their task is to confuse us by pummeling us with so many contradictory angles that, it keeps us busy looking for all those. Well, maybe the real secret they don't want us to get hold of stays yeah. buried, if you like. Well, hey, Nick, let me hit you with a few questions from the Internet because we're kind of getting down to the last 10 right. minutes or so. But uh, do you think there are physics that explain UFO movement that are classified to the public? 
Yes, I think, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, the more our technology advances, the more and more difficult it's going to be to differentiate between our UFOs and somebody else's UFOs. I mean, you know, you look at the whole black triangle phenomenon of the last few decades, you know, there, there's, you can, there are cases where you can suggest some of these are extraterrestrial and some of them could be highly advanced military craft. But if some of them are highly advanced military craft, you know, to have some sort of vehicle that can go the size of a 747, you know, that can go from standing still to literally vanishing in an instant with no apparent acceleration effects on the crew. I mean, I'm using that as an example because there's a famous British case investigated by the Ministry of Defence in 93 where actually uh, a Royal Air Force um, observer saw this thing hovering over a military base in central England in 93 and he described it as like a, a black triangle almost the size of a 747 that was barely moving like 15 mile an hour and then just shot up into the sky and vanished, you know, in an instant. Now that would kill the crew. Right. Um, you know, with the G forces. So, yeah, I think there's clearly evidence of advanced technologies that go far beyond mainstream physics. But the problem is, again, it's who has access to it and, you know, to what extent or not they'll share it with anybody else. Right. Uh, another good one I got here that I liked was um, Have you ever experienced non ordinary life forms in shamanic states of consciousness or any other means? Um. I've had a few weird experiences. I mean, one of the big interests of mine is tulpas, the idea of, which are basically like thought forms where, you know, you concentrate on an image in the human mind and try and, you know, you go into like a trance-like meditative state and try and conjure up over a period of time, you know, whatever image, like, for example, the one I tried once was like a, like a black dog with fiery red eyes. Um, and then actually coming home late one night actually saw what looked just like that, but it looked like it was born out of the shadows from the street lights and the holes, etc. But it was almost as if you imagine the shadows were being manipulated by something to come to life for a brief instant and make it look like this spectral big black dog. Right. You know, it was almost too coincidental. And you know, tulpas are a particular fascination of mine, the idea that, you know, if you concentrate on something in your mind, you can literally kind of give birth to like manifest a quasi... It. But yeah, you can manifest it, and then it can actually take on like a quasi-independent existence, and the more people who believe in it, it sustains more strength, yeah. you know, and the more strength it gets, it's, and, it's, and it instills fear in the witness. In other words, it has to be seen to instill fear, which mm-hmm. it then feeds on like a psychic vampire to keep itself alive if you like so it's kind of like giving birth to a mind monster if something right like that. yeah maybe that has something to do with why uh hollywood has put out the idea of the grays maybe they know something like that and they're pushing it out maybe that also explains pretty much all cryptids you know um, well it could you yeah. i mean we all think you know there's weird stuff in the woods if enough people believe there's monsters in the woods maybe that actually brings them to life because so many people are intensely right. believing that they're, they're out there Almost like another version of the placebo effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, crazy. Um, uh, I guess another one I got here. I think I already we already kind of covered. I kind of know the answer to. But do you think there are other frequencies beings can exist on? And are like, would you say ghosts are multi multi dimensional beings rather than just spirits? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly things like quantum physics today. You know, they're allowing for the existence of extra dimensions or multi dimensions and i think you know the best way to describe it for me is you know you're driving your car listening to the radio you don't like the song that's playing so you flip to another channel and another one and another one you know but all these channels are playing at the same time but you can only be on one at any given moment and i think that's the same that some of these entities if not all of them you know are sort of like dimension hopping things you know, that makes more sense to me than just flitting back and forth from some faraway planet or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could explain why all these things are elusive. Ghosts, Bigfoot, you know, lake monsters, werewolves, aliens, you know, all these sort of things that exist in our folklore and mythology for thousands of years, you know, come and go, but they're always elusive to us. And, I, you know, I think that is the case. And, you know, my view on life after death and the question about ghosts you know, I'm not, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a believer in the rigid 
heaven and hell angle, you know, that there's this place where it's all cool and clouds and harps and this other place is full of fire and pitchforks. You know, I don't believe that. I, but I, what I do think is that there's a good chance that some essence survives bodily death and it transcends to, you know, a one of these multi-dimensions or, you know, it can surf all of them because it's not in, like, physical form. And maybe, you know, they manifest in our dimension from time to time and we see them again. You know, I, I think life after death possibly will be explainable via, you know, the science of something surviving and, you know, accessing other multi-dimensions that maybe the ancients knew about these these multi-dimensions yeah. and kind of put their their spin on them and, and classed them as, you know, hell or the underworld or whatever. But it was just another realm of existence, you know. Yeah. All right. So, well, I mean, it's getting to be that time. And, you know, simply hearing your journalistic approach to this stuff is very refreshing to me because, I mean, I don't, I'm not calling anybody a liar, but like I said in the beginning, I've had guests that it seems like they're astral projected on Sunday, channeling and entities on Monday, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I just think, man, let me follow you around with a camera for one week, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I think we've got to remain balanced and, you know, try not to let belief overtake us. But, you know, I think most people who delve into this, like me, you know, you do have occasional weird flashes of strange stuff going on. But, you know, we've got to try and keep it balanced and determine what happened and not hope it was this or hope it was that, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Nick. I mean, you've been a real prince. Tell people how they can get your books and what you got going okay. on. All right. Well, people can get my books from Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, they can contact me at nickredfern14, F-O-R-T-E-A-N, dot blogspot dot com, or just type Nick Redfern into Facebook. Um, I've got another book out later this year, which is called The World's Weirdest Places, which is basically Hi. a study of 25 sort of like window portal type areas where, you know, they've just been hot oh, spots nice. for a whole range of weird activity. You got um, the uh, Bermuda Triangle in there? Bermuda Triangle, um, place in Texas called the Big Thicket where there's been Bigfoot and UFO sightings.